Alex, for me to dig into the philosophy of biology, uh, the philosophy of evolutionary biology is sort of the core of philosophy of biology and other things can, can be derived from it. I look for the most general principles. Uh, there are a lot of specifics, I know I've dealt with that, but I want to get some of the, the core uh, approaches. You have focused on the nature of purpose and teleology, which at one point was a, uh, uh, a, a pejorative word. At uh, one point, it dominated all before Darwin, obviously, and then it became pejorative. And in recent times, it seems to have reemerged among philosophers of biology in a different sense than in a theological sense, of course, but it has reemerged. Uh, what is your approach to teleology and biology? So the, it's, it's interesting that um, Kant said in, what, 1804, there'll never be a Newton for the blade of grass. And what he meant, of course, was that the domain of biology explanations had to be purposive unlike the domain of physics where they were purely mechanical. And of course, 20 years after he said that in Shropshire, the Newton of the blade of grass was born. <laughs> and that's Charles Darwin. And Darwin uh, banished, in my opinion, purpose from nature. Now, this is a debate in contemporary philosophy of biology. Did Darwin naturalize purpose? Did Darwin make purpose safe for mm, science? Yeah, yeah. Or did Darwin show us that the universe was completely bereft and devoid of purpose? And um, insofar as biological explanation appeals to and finds indispensable function, functional explanation, talking about the function of things, it looks like dar biological explanation does appeal to purpose. But I don't think so. I think that we need to understand functional language in a way that enables us to see that it's just a convenient way of talking about purely physical mechanistic causation. My view is that if you think that Darwin made uh, science safe for, made purpose safe for science, okay, then you're effectively saying that the scientific revolution that started with Newton, banishing purpose from nature, Okay, is one that somehow ends when Newton restores purpose to nature. But by showing us that the appearance of purpose is just that, it's just the simulacrum, uh, an overlay that we put on nature because we didn't understand what the causal mechanism that produced the appearance of purpose is, you're not you're doing a disservice to the profound scientific revolution that Darwin perpetrated, that Darwin uh, 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 achieved because it's Darwin that shows that the domain of biology is part of the domain of the rest of the physical sciences. And he did it by showing that appeal to purpose or end or goal uh, or function was only a useful metaphor at most, only a, 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 a handy instrument for organizing the way in which we deal with the biological domain. But there's nothing out there in the biological domain that uh, actually reflects any causal power at all to goal, purpose, end, uh, or any of those other um, teleological ways of looking at the biological domain. Is there an issue with the definition of teleology uh, for example, if I, uh, if I use a different word, uh, trophism. Uh, tr trophism means that there's a kind of a, a tendency to go to one direction without implying, you know, because teleology sort of sounds like theology, so maybe, maybe it has some <laughs> connotation that brings with it. So I'm going to come up with a different word that doesn't even sound like theology. So it's not teleology, it's trophism. So that, does that make you any happier? No, because... Uh, <laughs> Because I don't want to make you happy. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of goal-directed systems in, in the biological domain, including us, mm -hmm. and all the way down to planaria or euglena. Sure, 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 uh, sure, sure. uh, to say something is goal-directed is to say that its behavior uh, responds sensitively to its environment mm -hmm. in such a way as to enable us to predict where to end up. Okay? 
But for that behavior to reflect the operation of real purpose, teleology, and there's got to be some goal represented somewhere in the right. mechanics. The way you defined that was our looking at it. But yeah. you, how about from the, the, the entity's point of view itself? Well, I mean, that's a different perspective. But I don't think that entities have points of view from which their behavior is directed at some target. That's what would be required in order... I'm not saying a mind. I'm not saying a point of view like a mind has to have a point of view. Well, well, but then the question is, um, when you reduce the, uh, the level of your description of the machinery yeah. okay, to a level that makes it a reasonable one for describing tropism, mm -hmm. okay, is there anything left in the explanation of how the organism engages in this behavior for purpose or goal to add to, for example, hardwiring or operant conditioning or learned uh, responses of a sort that, from the neuroscientist's point of view, we understand perfectly well without appeal to teleology? Yes, uh, the question is, uh is uh, the increasing complexity of organisms, uh, is, is there some sort of natural law or natural uh, trophism is the word I like to use that draws everything towards this entity or is it totally random uh, so, and, and, and exploring the entire possibility space of everything at the same time? It's not totally random. Um, but each of the kind of mechanisms that we need to appeal to, or general schemas that we need to appeal to, to to explain this behavior, they're all substitution instances of the mechanism that Darwin originally identified. And uh, someone you, you interviewed uh, in the past, Dan Dennett, is really famous for talking about these multiple levels of selection of mechanisms of mm. blind variation and natural selection which produce the behavior that we call tropistic or operant or ultimately mm -hmm. conscious. <laughs> and he talks about Darwinian mechanisms and Pavlovian mechanisms and Skinnerian <laughs> mechanisms <Pavlovian>. and Gregorian <laughs> mechanisms for the well-known Oxford neuroscientist Gregory um, who uh, uh, extended this mechanism of blind variation and natural selection operating at each of these different levels yeah. to show us how there's nothing at any of these levels of complexity that really requires an indispensable appeal to purpose. Okay. Now, what I really enjoyed was your um, blogging debate with Dan uh, on purpose. Uh, Al, both of you obviously agree on the fundamentals. There's no fairy dust in life. There's no spirit that causes uh, consciousness. So, so on every level that the world may debate upon, you guys are lockstep in agreement. But yet you had this violent, I, I use violent in quote because you're great friends, but this violent debate. So what was the, what was the essence of the debate? And, and basically you're saying that the, if you look at the debate, Dan, you and I agree, uh, you think this is a happy result and I think it's a lousy result, but this is the truth. Yeah, so, you know, um, there's uh, optimistic <laughs> right? natural, yeah, there's <laughs> optimistic naturalism and pessimistic naturalism. Um, and he's the optimistic uh, naturalist, yeah. Dan. Uh, and I think a, a lot of people who want to save purpose for science, for yeah. biology, they're interested in this distinction that's of another philosopher, famous philosopher, uh, uh, Wilfred Sellers is manifest, uh, famous yeah. for the manifest yeah. image and the latent image. Yeah, yeah. And I'm on the latent side. And Dan wants to show that the manifest image can be reconciled with science. Mm. Okay, And I tend to think that it can't be. Yeah. And where Dan sees the sort of remainders, the, uh, yeah. the parts that we can't quite yeah. Yeah. stuff right. in right. to the reconciliation right. project, I see as the shoe squeaking and revealing the fact that the difference between the latent, the manifest image it, it, and the scientific image one. is not only serious but irresolvable. Right. And that while for getting along in everyday life, we've got right. to have the manifest image, right. 
when we find ourselves in the laboratory, it's a huge mistake, it seems to me, and it's always driving us in the wrong direction. Yeah. And that the great insights in biology as well as in the physical sciences have been by those who have figured out how what the manifest image tells us has got to be purpose is really just a causal mechanism. Okay, now uh, let me tell you where I stand on this because I've been pushing you with question. Now I'll just lay on table where I stand. And I, I love all your arguments, but I would disagree with you in terms that the, the trophisms are, are totally reducible. Yet, if I would give you that, if I'd say, okay, I'm gonna assume that you're right, I'd be 100% on your side in your argument with Dan. And I've seen a lot of, uh, of, of uh, philosophers and scientists who have that same physicalism, 100% physicalism, try to you know, bring in in some way the nature of human beings and purpose and all of that. And to me, that's a, um, that is a rationalization or trying to, to increase their appeal so they don't look like this, they're, they're, they're mean people. <laughs> I don't know if, it's, it, it, if that's it so much as there is a strong imperative in the philosophy of science not to dictate to scientists and to try to make sense of what scientists say. And if the scientists tell us that in understanding the phenomena with which they deal, especially the biological sciences, um, that their descriptions, when they tend to be teleological or purpose-driven, that their descriptions are the best and most appropriate descriptions, then there's going to be a lot of interest in trying to analyze those descriptions in such a way as to show that they're perfectly compatible with a purely physicalistic approach to the nature of reality. And if you take that line seriously, you adopt a very successful analysis of functional language and purpose of language. It's the so-called selected effects teleolo uh, teleology. And the selected effects analysis of purposive and functional language in the philosophy of biology, of course, is using Darwin's theory, using the principle of blind variation and natural selection to provide the underlying meaning of sentences in the mouths of biologists that look like they're committed to purpose when they're really a reflection of the operation of this purely causal process. And that's the naturalizing pro project of the philosopher of biology to show that purpose is safe for science, okay? Now, when I look at how, say, in molecular biology, Watson and Crick and the molecular revolution um, unravel that, uh, that approach, I can't any longer accept that there's a real role for purpose.